Thank you all for joining this evening's Sentinel Therapy Awareness webinar. I'm Stacey Newman with the Structural Heart Medical Affairs Division of Boston Scientific. We have a great agenda for you tonight. Our speakers will be highlighting the importance of evaluating subtle neurological defects caused by TAVR, discrepancies between clinical presentation and neurological imaging, stroke risk predictors and the need for cerebral embolic protection among patients with varying surgical risk, and finally, the topic of evolving TAVR economics and changes to reimbursement will be addressed. With that, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our renowned faculty, Dr. David Z. Rose and Dr. Hamal Gada. Dr. Rose is a vascular stroke neurologist at the University of South Florida College of Medicine, as well as the medical director of the Neurosciences Intensive Care Unit at Tampa General. He is triple board certified in internal medicine, neurology, and stroke, and has published many articles on the topic in peer-reviewed journal journals. Dr. Rose has played an integral role in bringing a neurology awareness to left atrial appendage closure therapy and TAVR. Dr. Gada is president of UPMC Heart and Vascular Institute at Pinnacle and is the Structural Interventionalist Cardiologist certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine. He is the Medical Director of the Structural Heart Program at UPMC Pinnacle and holds tremendous experience with novel structural heart technology. Dr. Gada is champion of institution-wide initiatives to improve economic outcomes of cardiovascular care and is also well published and inter internationally regarded as a thought leader in structural heart disease. Welcome both of you. During the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A function to ask questions. We will also be opening up the lines at the end of each talk for live Q&A. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Rose to kick us off. Dr. Rose. Thank you, Stacy, And thank you to Boston Scientific for having us here tonight to talk about stroke and TAVR. Uh, yes, I am a strokeologist. That's pretty much all I do all day, every day when I'm on call here at Tampa General Hospital in sunny Florida. It's not sunny now, it's dark, but usually pretty sunny here. Uh, and one of the things that makes our place unique and a lot of other places are developing this is our excellent collaboration with our cardiology colleagues. Um, we work together on a lot of uh, complex, challenging cases. And we've organized a neurocardio program at University of South Florida here to really expedite and streamline care for patients in situations when they need heart and brain uh, connections um, and dialogue. And one of the things we'll talk about tonight is just, just one of the many facets of our collaboration. And that is the underdiagnosis of stroke in TAVR. Stroke happens in TAVR and there is a way to prevent it. So, one of the things that we'll impart to you tonight is some of the neurological implications of that. We'll talk about some clinical data. And then uh, Dr. Gata has a great presentation lined up for you as well on the reimbursement for CEP. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I want to mention here as on the first slide, my Twitter account at DR Stroke, at Dr. Stroke. Uh, if you have any uh, great medical uh, questions, you can exchange them on Twitter. We joke about it with politics, but it's actually quite useful uh, that people share slides and, and information and, and pictures of, of great cases. And, and there's also some great dialogue there, surprisingly enough. So with that, I'll go ahead and um, get started. We're gonna uh, share my screen here. Okay, everybody see that all right? Great. It's, it's perfect. So these are the objectives for tonight. We're gonna to identify some subtle neurologic deficits associated with TAVR. We'll review some MRI brain scans. I know it sounds like an anathema to the cardiologist sometimes, but I think it's important for us to look at each other's imaging. Um, you know, this is how the collaboration really gets to the next level. Um, and you'd be surprised how uh, often uh, we can uh, get things done with, uh, with looking at each other's uh, data and, and sharing. Um, as opposed to remaining in these silos. That, that's gonna be an anachronistic model in the future. And there's gonna be more and more programs like ours that really work uh, synch uh, synchronistically here. Um, we'll talk about something called silent brain infarcts, SBIs, 
which really aren't so silent, and we'll talk about why. And we'll discuss the long-term patient outcomes associated with stroke and SPIs. But also, the most important thing here is we're going to advocate for, for all patients, uh, but specifically for the ones at lower surgical risk, uh, such as younger TAV or candidates. And why is that? Well, the younger patient is going to live longer than the older patient on average. And so if they have a deficit, even though they may be at lower risk, they're not at zero risk. And if they have a neurologic deficit, or even if they have an SBI that's maybe not so silent, um, you're talking the, the decades of, of a deficit and that could leave them you know, scarred for, for many years and unable to work and depressed and with other cognitive deficits. So certainly um, everybody, in my opinion, um, should be uh, able to have the same uh, preventive uh, service. Stroke in perspective is on this slide. 50% or more of all hospitalizations for any acute neurologic disease is stroke. The other 50% is every other neurologic disease you could think of, ALS, MS, epilepsy, and so forth. Uh, that's only 50%. Stroke represents a huge public health burden. Uh, we are the number five cause of death in the US, the number two in Europe and Asia. And I think we've actually unfortunately moved into the number six position when coronavirus uh, has uh, unfortunately taken 210,000 Americans as of, as of today. So um, stroke is, is right behind that. So Corona is probably number four, number three. Now, unfortunately, we're still the number one cause of permanent disability, not just in the U.S. and around the world. 800,000 stroke patients uh, uh, annually in the U.S. kills just under 200,000. And uh, six to seven million stroke survivors in the U.S., so right now, uh, so there's a big uh, public health burden, a big uh, cost, $110 billion a year is what was estimated in a recent study. Uh, and that's not just the direct cost of going to the hospital and medications and the ICU stay and my bill, which is not small. Um, no, just kidding. I'm an academic. Uh, but also the indirect costs of missing time off from work and the caregiver costs and so forth. So uh, there's also emotional costs involved that you can't put a price tag on. But specifically, what causes ischemic stroke? Well, we know there are over 200 known causes of ischemic stroke. Not talking about hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic represents about 20% of all strokes, ischemic about 80%. And if you divide that, you can find 200 known causes right now. The top five I put into a pie chart for you as you can imagine, cardioemboli is a big chunk. About a quarter of all ischemic strokes are from cardioemboli. And if you further divide that, about half of all cardioemboli is AFib. The other half of cardioemboli is, you know, infective endocarditis, uh, valvular disease, um, uh, MI with, let's say, LV dysfunction and a clot there, um, and uh, so forth. Large vessel atho is 20% of all strokes, not just the extracranial carotid ICA atherosclerosis, but also intracranial stenosis too. Small vessel lacunar disease, otherwise known as hypertension, uh, cause little tiny lacunar strokes in the brain that can have a pretty significant uh, neurologic deficit, usually resulting in hemibody weakness or numbness. And then there's a rare causes representing about 5% of all strokes. Hypercoagulable states like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, genetic diseases, uh, cerebral vasculitis, other inflammatory causes. Those are rare, but we see them at our academic centers, of course. And then a big chunk, about 30% or so of strokes are cryptogenic, which means that we just don't know, despite a million dollar workup, what the cause is of the stroke. Um, it's about 30%, not on my watch, but that's just you know national average. And I joke, but also, you know, when they come to an academic center, we tend to get more testing, we tend to go more in depth, and we are able to uncover a lot of uh, the etiologies of cryptogenesis. Uh, we also do, um, you know, obviously cardiac uh, monitoring long term in the outpatient that can detect AFib and other um, arrhythmias uh, down the road as well. I like this slide a lot because it talks about TAVR specifically and SAVR uh, trials and the percent of patients with stroke in these trials. It is not trivial. These are not uh, low numbers. And they look like you know, 0.6 is, is not that high, but 
Um, obviously, as you get higher risk, the likelihood of having a stroke gets higher and higher. In the intermediate risk group, it's ranges between 2% and 3.5%. I mean, that could be a lot of patients, you know, in a thousand person study, right? Um, in, in the high risk group, the weighted average is about 4% of all strokes having, uh, you know, coming from the TAVERS and SAVERS. And the bars that have little brains on top of them represent studies in which there is a mandated per protocol baseline and follow up eval by a neurologist or a neurology PA or NP or a neurology fellow of some sort. And so those are obviously a lot higher because these folks are trained to look for subtle neurologic deficits. Um, and then get the MRI, you know, you need that one, two uh, obvious uh, hit uh, to, to go and, and uh, confirm and diagnose a stroke. And as you can see, the, the highest number is 9.1% of all TAVR, SAVR patients having uh, in strokes. And that was the, the Sentinel. So it was a TAVR uh, group. And, and honestly, that is unacceptable. That is woefully uh, inadequate. We are not doing a good job of protecting these uh, patients who are going in to prevent stroke, getting a, a procedure, you know, improving their, their valve and their quality of life and, and, and so forth and preventing failure and then winding up having a stroke. That's uh, really uh, unfortunate. And I get called on these patients and I would like to stop getting called on them. I want to live in a world where people get this uh, uh, prevention, this device, this sentinel that can uh, not result in uh, even the minor deficits that really aren't so minor, we'll talk about in a sec. And, and the major deficits that people can have in these uh, post taver and SAVR strokes are clinically apparent, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, though. Those are things we can see, obviously, with our clinical exam, the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale Score, and the Modified Rankin Scale Score, as you can see, the tip of the iceberg. But below the water surface, there's a lot of subtle and often undetected, um, clinically unrecognized signs and symptoms. Uh, that can have far-reaching effects. And these are things that may be detected by, let's say, a mini mental status exam or the MOCA, uh, you know, cognitive assessment or other neurocognitive tests and batteries, or even neuroimaging like a brain MRI. The sharper the Tesla of the MRI, the, the, the more likely we'll be able to detect these uh, smaller strokes. As you know, strokes come in a variety of different symptoms and signs. More commonly, we'll see hemibody weakness usually face, arm, and leg, uh, or numbness, or visual loss like HH, uh, hemi, uh, vision field deficit, uh, but also aphasia, which is the loss of ability to speak or understand speech. The other less common symptoms that you'll see and, uh, is vertigo, double vision, and balance and coordination, cognitive effects, and uh, neglect or hemi inattention syndromes. Um, and I say less common with the caveat, they also overlap with other uh, diagnoses, uh, such as uh, ENT uh, items or BPPV and other things, so not necessarily related to stroke, um, could be other uh, comorbidities. However, if you see these things appear acutely, you know, right after uh, a TAVR procedure is done, you know, an MRI is obviously required to diagnose. It's probably not an alternate etiology. It's probably a stroke. So with that in mind, let's take a quick poll. Do TAVR patients at your hospital routinely undergo neurologic exam pre and or post procedure? Um, answer A is never. Answer B, only after TAVR when a stroke is suspected. Answer C is reserved for patients with a history of neurocognitive dysfunction or stroke. And then answer D is yes, pre and post TAVR, it's routine protocol at my institution. There's no right answer. We just wanna know what happens at your place. Vote now, please. Okay, what kind of answers did we get? Okay, interesting. So 84% only after a TAVR when a stroke is suspected, uh, nobody, uh, does it for patients with history of neurocognitive function or stroke, in other words, the higher risk patients. Uh, and then only 11% uh, say yes, they do it on everybody pretty much as a routine protocol at your institution. Uh, and there is 5% uh, that say never, it's never really done. And I appreciate your honesty. 
Um, I think that we're trending more towards um, answer D, that uh, it's routine protocol at the institution that you're at. Um, and I would advocate that, uh, you know, there's no right answer to this. Um, and a lot of folks like our institution only after TAB or when a stroke is suspected. Um, however, you know, you will detect more the more you look. It's like, uh, you know, you'll, you'll find more fevers if you have a thermometer in your pocket. Uh, so the more you look, the more you'll find. I think that uh, you more, the more you get used to looking for subtle neurologic deficits, the more you'll see that, unfortunately, these folks after TAVR will have this junk flicked off from the heart to the brain and cause um, these type of things that may not improve. This is uh, some pictures of cerebral vascular anatomy. I'm sure most of the folks in this call are well uh, versed in the extracranial vessels, the aorta, the internal carotids, and the vertebral arteries that supply the head. But with respect to the circle of willis in the brain, you know, this is a very um, tightly uh, supplied cross-flowing vessel network. And what happens is, is that there is a compensation if a patient has a large artery stenosis or an occlusion, blood can uh, be sent from one section to another section of brain if there is adequate uh, areas that are open. But if there is stenosis in multiple different locations, as you can see in the branch points here in these vessels, then the compensation mechanisms are um, unfortunately poorly uh, adequately supplying uh, the territories and that's where stroke happens when there's just a lack of blood flow in a clogged pipe that uh, starves brain tissue of oxygen and leads to infarction and stroke. Now, what causes stroke during TAVR? As you can see from these diagrams, there's a lot of debris that can get showered to the brain from the heart and the arch. You know, the ascending arch um, has calcific and atherosclerotic material uh, that uh, embolize. There's stenotic valves with leaflet tissue that can go to the brain, uh, acute thrombi, organized clot. Um, and, you know, there's foreign material, even myocardium. And the, the, all this stuff can be embolized during the procedure. And uh, Dr. Gatta will show you some slides of actual patients um, who have received a uh, sentinel and the, the junk that gets caught I'd rather have this little net filter uh, catch it than it wind up in the brain. And here's why, if you look at this slide, this is a violin plot of the radii of the vessels of the major brain arteries that we just showed you in the previous slide. Uh, ACA stands for anterior cerebral artery, VA is basilar artery, ICA you know is the internal carotid, MCA is a middle cerebral artery, there's the M1 division in red, M2 in purple, and the posterior cerebral arteries in brown, this is a violin plot because these look like little violins because the variation among different patients is there, but it's only in millimeters. We're talking very, very tiny arteries that supply our brain and our brain functions. And so you don't need a giant thrombus organized in the heart to go flicking off to the brain to cause a neurologic deficit. And if you see this upper right-hand corner of this slide, it shows you um, in the Sentinel IDE trial, the percent of emboli that is captured and caught and the actual size of each percent. So 14% are greater than or equal to two millimeters. 55% are greater than or equal to one millimeter. And look at the ACA, that's one millimeter on average. Uh, the basal R is a little more variation, but can be as small as 0.5, as big as maybe two. The ICA, the biggest artery is about on, the mean is about 1.5 to two millimeters. So if you think, you know, over half of all these emboli are only a millimeter, then for goodness sakes, of course, they're going to clog up these pipes. These pipes are not very big. And, and, and those are the clean pipes, right? Most of these folks have a fair amount of athro in the brain like they have in the coronaries. And so they're gonna be at a, a deficit anyway because they're gonna be behind the eight ball, I should say, because they're already partially clogged probably already in a lot of these arteries. So you're looking at even smaller radii than are straight displayed here on the slide. So of course, um, you know, you'll have a lot, 99% are greater than 0.15 millimeters, 
but you don't need a giant, you know, centimeter uh, clock to go clog up these pipes, just, uh, you know, two, mil two millimeters or, or less. And this is what happens. This is what we see when we order a brain MRI, all right? And how can we tell if it's acute or chronic? Well, there are different sequences of the brain MRIs that are done routinely when you order an MRI of the brain. So a little bit of neuroradiology education here for those of you who don't routinely look at these scans. On the left, you see acute phase post-TAVR lesions. There's the baseline clean DWI, diffusion weighted imaging sequence of the brain MR. And then two to seven days afterwards, you see those little bright white dots. Those are cortical hits. Those are emboli that flipped off bilaterally to the cortex of this person's brain. Now, did it cause a overt clinical sign or symptom on exam? Not necessarily right now, but could it lead to these uh, complications of SBIs, silent brain infarcts down the road, such as cognitive dysfunction or depression, impaired mobility, dementia, so forth? Absolutely. And that's what we're trying to prevent, right? So it doesn't take a whole lot of clot burden or big clot to cause these infarcts. And actually, if you see in red there, we've highlighted between 68% to 98% of TAVR cases have these DWI restrictions on their MRI that weren't there before. So we know that there is emboli going to the brain, whether it's causing a clinically overt stroke with hemibody weakness or aphasia or causing these silent brain infarcts we only detect on MRI, Really, in my opinion, it's not that relevant. A stroke is a stroke is a stroke. It's like being a little bit pregnant, right? You're pregnant. And whether it's a big stroke or a silent brain infarct, either one can lead to problems down the road, cognitive dysfunction, depression, impaired mobility, dementia, and are a harbinger for increased mortality. If you look at the chronic lesions on the flare sequence there on the right side of the screen, you see that over time from the baseline flare number one to number two to number three, the increased burden of white matter disease and emboli that have been showered to the brain over time. This results in a Swiss cheese brain where you have all these holes and, and lesions that absolutely can be associated with dementia and other problems. Now, SBI, these silent brain infarcts are the highest in TAVR compared to all the other cardiac procedures probably due to the hostile arch that you have to traverse to get to the valve, right? It's full of plaque. Of course, you're going to have a lot more uh, cardioemboli showering to the brain. And look at the mean number of SBI, silent brain infarcts in TAVR, 4.58 plus or minus. And for, compare that to PCI, 1.88, cabbage, 2.11, ABR, 2.16. Certainly not great numbers, but a lot higher with TAVR. I would say any SBI is too much but certainly TAVR is the highest risk. Now, these silent brain infarcts, as I'm trying to uh, explain here, are really misnomers. They are associated with future stroke, overt clinical strokes in the future, as was seen in this study called the NeuroVision Study of 1,000 patients of 65 years of age or older who underwent inpatient elective non-cardiac surgeries. Look at these SBIs all over the place, in the cerebellum, in the subcortex and in, in, in uh, slide B and slide C uh, in the cortex, the thinking part of the brain, bilaterally, you know these are from the heart, right? It's not a coincidence that post procedure or post op they have these brain lesions. Not good, not good. If you had a device to prevent this, you should be using it. That's my opinion as a stroke neurologist. I don't want to have to be consulted on these poor patients and tell them, you know, well, um, unfortunately this could have been prevented. I mean, I don't want to do that. So, you know, put this device in so we can prevent this from happening to these folks anyway, so they don't have these long-term sequelae. Look at this post-op delirium, SBI versus not, p-values is significant. Cognitive decline in a year, SBI versus not having SBIs, of course. An overt stroke or TI a year, much higher in the patients with the SBIs. Now, why do these lesions matter? Because they are a marker, a subclinical marker, for future symptomatic stroke. They increase the risk of future stroke, cognitive decline, and dementia by about two to four times. So again, look at the flare image showing the baseline SBI burden. You add to that burden with the diffusion-weighted imaging of the brain MRI showing all these new hits, and you're going to have a dramatically increased risk of further stroke 
of dementia, multi-infarct dementia, not Alzheimer's, that's a different cause of dementia, but multi-infarct dementia, cognitive decline and mortality. Now, how do we measure severity of stroke specifically? Well, there's two major tests that we do, the NIH stroke scale score, which is uh, divided into one to four for minor, five to 15 for moderate, 16 to 20 is moderate to severe, and greater than 21 is severe. But it really depends on your symptoms and, and the person, right? Someone could have a severe deficit and a low stroke scale score. Let's say if they have some arm, arm weakness, but they're, they, they can't write anymore. And let's say they're a writer or a painter or you know, a pianist. I mean, this is a severe deficit for them. Or if they're a news reporter or a physician and they can't speak, I mean, that's a very low stroke scale score number, but that is a severe deficit for them. And then the modified Rankin talks about the symptoms and the uh, global disability that a person will have at home when they go home, you know, doing their regular routine ADLs, if they can do them or not. So this idea about this minor stroke being a stroke scale score of less than eight is also, in my opinion, as a stroke neurologist, a misnomer, you know, just like if you were to say, well, Dr. Rose, didn't you say that silent brain infarcts were a misnomer? Yes, I think minor stroke is a misnomer too. Again, it's like being a little bit pregnant. You know, minor strokes are still strokes and they're associated with cognitive and physical impairments and depression. Look at this, 44% at three years have a cognitive impairment, depression ranging from 22 to 39%. And then how many are dependent with a moderate severe disability? 12%. That is not a little bit. That's a lot of folks having a, de a full dependency, meaning wheelchair bound or in bed all the time. This is not what you want your patients to have after undergoing a TAVR procedure. Goodness sakes. So this idea about it being a, a moderate or mild stroke, you know, I think it really is uh, need, needing to be reclassified. What about the younger patients? We get this question a lot. I'm, I'm happy to talk about any of these topics. You know, if you want to type in some questions, Dr. God and I are open to uh, having discussions with you all. Thank you again for joining us here. But younger patients obviously should get this device as well. Why? Because if they do have the stroke, now granted they're less likely because they're younger, maybe less atherosclerotic burden and so forth, but they still can have it, right? And so 33% will have significant financial strains. 56, so over half, won't be able to return to work, and 79% will have a decrease in social activities. That is going to be a major issue for them if they have another five decades of life to live, right? So if they're a younger patient, and you think, oh, well, I don't necessarily need, you know, the Sentinel. I disagree. I think these are exactly the patients you want to put them into because they could have a much longer amount of time of disability than someone who's in their 80s and 90s, right? So I think everybody, quite frankly, should wind up getting this device because you want to try to prevent stroke in the young patients who are going to live another 50 years and the older patients who are more likely to have this problem. So does stroke increase mortality in hospitalized patients? Absolutely. 12.7% in stroke patients die versus 2.8% of all the other patients in the hospital, p-value, less than 0.001, and then 30-day mortality, 16.7% versus 3.7% if you don't have a stroke. And then, of course, patients with stroke go home less often um, and wind up going to extended care or rehab facilities or nursing home or to the morgue, unfortunately, compared to those patients who don't have a stroke or hospitalized. And we're winding up now, but I want to talk about TAVR and the a number of procedures that any uh, one person or one group will have done that thinking that, well, you know, if I am at a high volume center and I do a ton of these cases, then maybe I'll be less likely to provoke the stroke and less likely to need the protection device. And that's just false. Look at this data from New York, uh, about 8,700 TAVR procedures done between 2012 and 2016. And if you see the low volume groups between one and 23 versus the medium 24 to 79 versus the high volume groups greater than or equal to 80. About the, st well, statistically the same, 1.5% of strokes versus 2.0% of strokes versus 1.3%. Obviously, statistically the same. Look at the P values, look at the confidence intervals rather, they cross unity. So whether you have done one or 80, uh, it doesn't matter. And there's 207 different operators that were in this study. 
you know, a stroke is a stroke is a stroke. Just because you're a lot more experienced at doing the procedure doesn't make the hostile arch any less atherosclerotic, right? It doesn't make your patients less complex. So unfortunately, uh, that really doesn't matter as, as it's shown here in this data. It's going to provoke a stroke no matter what. So in summary, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Thanks to Boston Scientific. Um, it's a pleasure to have a neurologist sit at a table with cardiologists, and I certainly enjoy this. I have my background in uh, Cleveland Clinic, internal medicine, before I did my uh, neurology residency at the University of Miami, and then on to uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia for my stroke fellowship. So I always enjoy talking about these uh, collaborations. You know, stroke can be caused by over 200 etiologies. It's part of my job to figure out why people have a stroke when they come to the hospital, to treat them acutely in the ER, and then to make sure long-term in the clinic they do are okay. But cardioemboli during TAVR, it's like a seatbelt. You know, accidents happen, uh, but cardio, cardioembolic strokes during TAVR, they're preventable. And in 2020, we should be using devices that can prevent stroke if we can. Now, what happens? Ischemic stroke is caused when debris travels up to the brain and includes one or more cerebral arteries. The, the brain requires a, a patent blood supply to... Uh, to work, and so even tiny hits in these tiny arteries can cause significant deficits. The hostile calcified aortic arch can explain why these silent brain infarcts, which really a misnomer, is highest in TAVR versus all the other cardiac procedures. Um, but this SBI term really needs to be renamed because the consequences can be acute, not just not, can be severe, not just in the, in the acute setting, but in the long term with the cognition aspect. You know, these people um, post TAVR, we see we get consulted. Uh, they, they're confused, maybe not overtly aphasic or hemiparetic, but they don't know their spouse's name anymore, right? That's not normal. Uh, they can't tie their shoes anymore. They don't remember how to use a scissors or drive their car. I mean, that's that's an apraxia. It's not a major, obvious hemibody weakness or numbness or slurred speech, but that is not minor. You know, if you don't know how to drive anymore, right? You, for, you forget who, who your grandkids are. I mean, this is something that is preventable and, and should not be a uh, sequela of a procedure that you're trying to do to, to help someone's uh, survivability and their quality of life. Uh, so the physical deficits post-stroke increase the risk of 30 mortality, of course, by how much? By a factor of five. And minor strokes, not so minor, technically less than eight in the stroke skill score, but they are, of course, associated with long-term cognitive impairments and depression and other problems. So with that, I'll open the floor to some questions if anyone has any right now in the meantime, before we get to Dr. Gada's uh, talk. Uh, but if not, we'll go ahead and, and uh, share with the, the rest of the group uh, his interesting uh, so with that, um, thank you so much, Dr. Rose. Very informative presentation. There was, a, we did have a participant raise his or her hand, uh, Benaya Basial. I don't know if you're on the line, if you wanted to ask your question. You just need to unmute yourself. Kelly, can you unmute the participant? I've sent them a request to unmute and they just need to, to hit that button on their screen. Usually if you scroll your mouse over the bottom of the screen, it should come up with a few icons and you can unmute yourself. Kelly, can you open up all the lines? Checking. Okay. We'll wait another moment. Otherwise, we can come back to you. Oh, uh, okay. Well, while we're working on that, there was another question that came in in the queue, and this is from Mark Grow. Do you think the current Sentinel trial will show efficacy for embolic protection with Sentinel? I think we're going to get to that in the next section. Yeah, I, I certainly uh, hope so. Uh, I think that it will, um, but you know, I have no crystal ball. You know, a lot of folks want and need this data. 
either just to convince themselves or to show administrators to get the Sentinel at their hospital. At the end of the day, you know, Dr. God is going to show you some slides of pictures of debris that's captured by Sentinel. To me, that speaks volume. Uh, you know, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, but, you know, I get consulted also on these folks uh, post taver and I wish I weren't, right? And there's something that you can do to prevent that. So, yes, it'd be great to have this data. Uh, some centers, as, as he will tell you, uh, don't need that data. They're going and using it on everybody. Um, and I, I admire that approach. It's, it's, um, it's forward thinking. But a lot of, a lot of folks, even in my institution, um, need, need that, that hard evidence. And I, I certainly hope that that comes. Well, we couldn't unmute. Uh, yeah, he must have stepped away. So well, let's move on to Dr. Gada's section. Great, Dr. thanks. Thanks, Stacy. So uh, I'm going to go over some clinical uh, data. Uh, I'm an implanting TAVR cardiologist, and so I do a lot of these procedures. Did five of them today, and we'll talk about our sentinel use at UPMC Pinnacle. Uh, but it's very clear that we are moving TAVR into lower risk populations, and that's kind of kind of be an undercurrent of the talk that I'm giving now. Uh, when we started this, obviously back in the 20 teens with the clinical trials, we were doing this in inoperable and high risk folks. But more and more, we're pushing on to commercialization of lower risk candidates, and with the two seminal trials that were completed and presented at ACC last year. Uh, we now have commercialization of low-risk transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Um, this has been quite a journey, but these trials are going to tell us a lot more in the future. These one to two year snapshots that we've had aren't going to speak to what we get at five or 10 years. And some of the things that Dr. Rose was talking about with silent cerebral emboli, keep in mind that in partner three trial, no one got a Sentinel device. And in the Medtronic low risk trial, it was an extraordinarily small sliver of the clinical trial population. So with that said, uh, let me just uh, roll ahead here and talk about what commercial TAVR looks like. Now, TAVR volumes are indeed increasing. We all know this. And with the commercialization of low risk, uh, we can see kind of a very palpable shift in the TAVR volumes and TAVR centers that we'll talk about in a moment, offering this therapy very readily. Uh, with that comes basically a cannibalization of surgical AVR volume, and that's been going on for a few years now. But TAVR is now lion's share majority of aortic valve replacement uh, in an isolated fashion. With this comes growth of centers. And with the uh, NCD being revised and those volume thresholds having dropped, more TAVR centers are now up and coming. Now, it's incumbent upon all of us to take care of our programs and not to just assume that we're going to get fed a steady stream of volume. And so it's very likely that many of you have strong competitor sites that are located in geographic proximity. Patients are going to have choice, just like they have choice where they get the percutaneous coronary intervention or their cardiothoracic surgery. They're going to have choice of where they get their transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And this can be used, Sentinel can be used as a very effective marketing tool. Uh, we've done that at our center over the last few years, and it's definitely garnered dividends. Uh, and this is something that you need to stay in front of when you're doing community seminar presentations, when you're out in your community talking about your transcatheter aortic valve replacement program, your structural heart program, you really want to mention Sentinel because it will give patients uh, the kind of feeling and, 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 and true motivation that you have of protecting them uh, from a devastating complication. And they will understand the mechanism of the device, and they'll definitely understand some of the screenshots that I'll show you later of the debris that's captured in these cases. So before I kind of jump into some of the topics that I'm going to be talking about, I'm just going to ask you a question about the barriers to entry at your, your, your hospital. Now, we uniformly use Sentinel. We use it on uh, anyone who's anatomically eligible, which is about 70 to 80% of our patients. But in your hospital, uh, what are the barriers, if any, to use Sentinel? Cost, lack of definitive clinical stroke data. It adds too much time to the procedure. All of the above 
Or are you like my site? We use it on every anatomically eligible patient. And while you're answering that question, I will say that we kind of jumped into Sentinel after the commercialization of the product in 2017. We were one of the first sites launched commercially for Sentinel. We were not in the Sentinel IDE. And uh, it was after a very thorough economic analysis that I had to do for my administration that we invited this technology in. Now, the economics are getting better, as we'll chat about, but uh, let's go ahead and see what people answered. So uh, basically, what we see here is that cost is a consideration. 29% of the group definitely thought that. But all of the above, it's not just the cost, it's the lack of what would be described as definitive clinical stroke data. We're going to talk about clinical data in a moment. And adding too much time to the procedure, maybe not so much, but all of the above uh, gets the lion's share majority. However, there are people on this WebEx or the Zoom meeting uh, that uh, use it on every anatomically eligible patient, about 24% of the population here. I think it's pretty representative. So uh, how do you break down the economics of Sentinel? Well, you have to think about the economics of your transcatheter aortic valve replacement program and how progressive are your surgeons in offering this therapy? How progressive is your administration in offering this therapy? Now, we do about 400 transcatheter aortic valve replacements a year. And even this year with COVID, we're going to be up near 400. And we're in a hospital in central Pennsylvania. It's a big hospital system. We have six hospitals, 1,200 beds that all feed into the hub in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is 380 beds. So if I'm doing 400 TAVRs, then I have a 380 bed hospital. I have to be really efficient because I can't really take up beds for long periods of time because I'm going to lose money for the institution in more than a couple of different ways. The biggest way is that I am blocking another DRG from coming into the hospital. Assuming that my hospital is full, which it is pretty much the line share majority of the time, like today, if my transcatheter aortic valve replacement patients are staying the weekend, then I'm going to have big problems with the administration. Now, how do you capture this? Well, if you're a lean, mean, taver machine program and you're discharging people very efficiently, you want to think about the utility of taver. It's not just the cost and it's not just the revenue that you're bringing in, but you're thinking about the denominator. So surgical aortic valve replacement is presented here at our institution. The modified contribution margin, or what I would call profit, uh, is $23,537, which is a very nice margin. You're going to find this in many centers around the country where surgical AVR has very good revenue coming in and that the costs make it still a very profitable procedure. Transcatheter aortic valve replacement, the costs are a little bit higher as far as the direct variable costs are concerned, the cost of the device, uh, and our margins are lower, but we're still profitable as a standalone TAVR program. Where it becomes uh, really apparent is when we think about our average length of stay with transcatheter aortic valve replacement, which is about a day and a quarter versus surgical AVR, which is over six days. And so again, it's a very easy argument to make. And one of the biggest reasons why we're able to make this argument is because obviously we avoid complications like stroke. Our costs per case have actually gone down in the Sentinel era and now have remained pretty much steady. Uh, we inaugurated the technology in fiscal year 2017. And since that period of time, costs have effectively been stable. Uh, really no difference in the way our economics are now. And I would say they're actually even slightly better. And we're going to talk about reimbursement in just a moment and why economically it's not as hard to bring Sentinel in to your practice because TAVR reimbursements have stopped dropping. So again, in order to do this, in order to run a successful TAVR program that's economically efficient, you have to avoid unnecessary complications like vascular complications, pacemakers, annular rupture, wire perforations, percarl effusion, tamponade, and of course, stroke. That's vital. The Sentinel Cerebral Protection System, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is the only FDA-cleared cerebral protection system on the market. It's got two independent filters that uh, work uh, very easily. The IFU for the calibers of the innominate artery and the left common carotid are 9 to 15 for the innominate and 6.5 to 10 for the left common carotid. You can insert this in through standard right radial access. Sometimes we have to go ulnar. 
Um, sometimes we have to go brachial. Um, all of those things are idiosyncratic to, to our patients. Um, one size is going to accommodate most vessel sizes, like I just discussed. And this compound curve catheter is really neat. Uh, for people who haven't seen this, um, this is kind of their, uh, their video of how this is done. Uh, they deploy the proximal filter. You're going to use that compound catheter. It's got 360 degrees of freedom associated with it, full flexion. And then we'll go ahead and deploy that distal filter. And uh, that's it. It's there for the case. It stays out of the way. You hug it right up against the outer curvature of the aorta and the arch. And uh, when you're done with the procedure, it's basically just repeating the steps, but doing them backwards and recapturing the device and taking it out. This is a very straightforward procedure for experienced users. This adds literally a minute or two to your average case. Are you going to get complicated anatomy? Sure. But most of the time, if you're looking at your CT scan or you're doing a quick arch aortogram, you're going to be able to land the Sentinel device within just a couple of minutes. You're going to have that procedural success a very high degree of the time. There was only one complication in the Sentinel IDE, and that was a brachial pseudoaneurysm that was injected with thrombin, uh, but a um, very safe device, obviously, to use. And the majority of your anatomies are going to be accommodating of this particular device. The clinical data. So I'm not going to go over too much about Sentinel IDE. What I will tell you to do, though, and I wasn't allowed to put this in a slide, but Jack Intervention article from the Minneapolis Heart Institute that just came out is a really interesting article. This was a nationwide uh, inpatient database sample, uh, the work that's done by the Healthcare Utilization Project for the government, where they look at all the discharges that are coming out of hospitals, and that's multiple healthcare plans. 36,000 plus patients in this sample. And this was in the era of cerebral embolic protection. So 525 of those patients actually got a Sentinel device. Then they did propensity matching, where they shaved that 33,000 number, 30,000 number down to about uh, 1,000 patients. And they compared the 525 to 1,000. And what you saw with Sentinel was a dramatic reduction in stroke in that particular analysis. We're talking like three and change percent to 1%. Now, the costs were a little bit higher. But again, the clinical benefit was very pronounced. And that's contemporary data in the current day and age. And it's, it's out there, it's commercial, and you, can, you obviously want these types of outcomes in your center. Now, Sentinel IDE, the interesting analysis that's shown here is that window analysis on the right with the 63% reduction in stroke at 72 hours. And you know, when you get beyond 72 hours, there are a lot of confounders, as Dr. Rose would tell you, about what could cause a stroke in a post-TAVR patient. But the dramatic stroke reduction that you're going to see is going to be the early stroke reduction facilitated by a cerebral embolic protection. It's not just that. It's not just stroke reduction. When you think about neurocognitive detriments, especially to a lower risk trial population or low risk population that's getting TAVR, you're thinking more about what are their long-term outcomes going to look like. It's not just the stroke that you may get as an incident. It's longer term if there is a neurocognitive effect to these cerebral emboli. When you put Sentinel in, you're going to be catching debris. There's no doubt about it. And then we're going to go over these little retrieval baskets in just a moment or these sieves that they uh, give you to basically harvest the material in the filters. You're going to capture debris in the vast majority of your cases. Uh, you know, We did four sentinels today out of five patients. The other one had a fistula for end-stage renal disease, so we didn't end up putting sentinel in that patient. But the point is that in all four of those patients, we caught debris. We were able to see it visually verify it. Uh, and I think that that's very important to do, uh, not just for your um, sense of satisfaction in doing a procedure and protecting a patient and the clinical outcome that you're going to get from that, but also reassuring the patient and their family members that you're doing all of this and keeping debris from going up to their brain. This debris can come from anywhere. The Sentinel histopathologic uh, analysis is from the IDE study. Um, the debris comes from everywhere. It comes from the myocardium. It comes from the delivery catheters. It comes from the valve. It comes from the atheroma. It comes from the calcium in the arch, everything. So you're going to catch all sorts of different things. And we just completed a low-risk histopathology analysis that's being uh, looked at by Renu Vermani and her colleagues uh, down in Maryland. And uh, with all of that data, we're going to be showing a lot more about what actually is being captured with this device, which I think is going to be significant. And it's going to be a variety of different things that people aren't even thinking about. So let's just jump from the clinical and marry it to the economic. We've already had inklings of that discussion before. 
But let me just break it down by perspective, because if you're a health economist, you don't think of what is cost effective just as a standalone question. You think of it uh, being based on perspectives. So the patient, there's a potential mitigation of stroke risk. There's a potential reduction in long-term cognitive impairment. We've been over that. The provider, TAVR is fee for service. You don't get reimbursed higher if you incur a stroke. Now, you may get a major complexity and comorbidity code that bumps up your DRG, but you can get that with the baseline, patient's baseline clinical state. You don't have to have them have a stroke in order to get reimbursed more. And furthermore, the stroke costs are more than likely going to eat away into that reimbursement. So again, you're not getting paid extra for this complication. So you're going to have a potential reduction in the incidence of an economically devastating consequence. And if you're in a bundled care model or a uh, pilot or anything like that, uh, and you're looking at bundled care uh, down the road for, for 90 days, or you're on the hook for your procedure, then the savings are going to be there because those stroke patients, they end up costing the system more in the longer term. The payer, well, they're going to be interested in reimbursing it because they have to pay for all that stuff. So Basically, if you're looking at just inpatient stays, but then acute rehab, skilled nursing care, outpatient follow-up, uh, payers are going to be motivated. And the nationwide inpatient sample data that just came out, um, that that actually would motivate payers to reimburse uh, Sentinel. Society, healthcare system, uh, that's a little bit more complicated, and it's a little bit more focused on the neurocognitive issues that we discussed earlier. And those are going to be probably evaluated a little bit more clearly in the five to 10-year follow-up data of these low-risk trials. Not going to go over everything, but just realize that your costs from stroke are significant in the hospital. The 30-day admission readmission rates go up, which dings you in a variety of different ways. And then, of course, the long-term costs are going to be an issue for all of these patients. So this is a very interesting article that I dug up from JAMA Neurology. Uh, Dave Rose gave me a, a little bit of a, why are you a cardiologist looking at JAMA Neurology? And he, he meant it in a very respectful way. I, I wasn't looking at JAMA Neurology. I just did a quick uh, lit search and I found this article. It's an interesting one. Uh, this is from the cardiovascular health study that was done between 1989 and 1993. It's about 6,000 patients that they followed for a mean of about 12 and a half years. And they looked at all of the different health problems that happened to these people in cardiovascular relation or cerebrovascular relation. They used a disability metric uh, in this cohort for the patients that got a stroke. And so these patients are accruing disability and then they have a stroke and their disability metric goes way up. And then they recover and it falls down again, but then they have no further clinical events. And then look what happens. It just ramps up again. Now, when you break it down, the annual change before stroke in this disability score was low. The change at the time of stroke was pronounced. But then after that, these people start accruing disability at a higher rate than their age match peers do who did not have a stroke. So it really is the gift that keeps on giving. And uh, it's something to really think about when we're thinking about neurocognitive outcomes in low-risk TAVR patients that did not get protected. That's adjusted uh, for a lot of confounders. So I, I felt like this was a really good analysis to throw out there, just to hypothesize about what could happen in our low-risk TAVR patients that don't get Sentinel. TAVR reimbursements have been changing dramatically since TAVR hit the market. We used to be packed in with surgical reimbursements, but as of 2016, TAVR had its own DRG. And since 2016, TAVR reimbursements have been going down uh, until a couple of years ago, which I'm going to explain in a moment. And the reason why they've been going down is because our length of stays keep dropping. And so, yeah, I run a very efficient TAVR program. We get people out in a day and a quarter now. I'm actually harming myself, right? Because my reimbursements are going to continue to go down because we're doing such a good job. Our length of stays are dropping. But the key caveat here is what happened two years ago is that TAVR reimbursements actually plateaued, and now they're coming back up. So I went to CMS and I petitioned on behalf of Claret Medical at the time for the Sentinel new tech add-on payment, which came through nicely. That new tech add-on payment is now expiring. And many people are like, well, now I won't be able to afford Sentinel. Number one, you didn't even know if you were getting the new tech add-on payment. There's no indicator that you were. Um, it's all idiosyncratic to the patient that you treated and it's charge-based uh, analysis by CMS as to whether or not you qualify for the new tech, new tech add-on payment, but you don't know actually if you've got it for an individual patient. So that aside, if your TAVR program is doing quite well, chances are you'll continue to do quite well because TAVR reimbursements are going up. 
So again, the combination of superior cost utility in a Sentinel program with tavern reimbursements going up, I think that if you're economically, you know, uh, have been strapped with regards to bringing in this device, this is now the time to have the discussion uh, because the the economic future for this device or the economic present for this device is much better than the past. So let's talk a little bit about the randomized control trial that's underway. Uh, large trial, 3,000 patients being randomized to Sentinel or without. Uh, it's currently ongoing. Uh, it's a great trial for people that are not like me. And so, you know, we have obviously some large volume sites out there, uh, sites like mine, where we put in Sentinel routinely. I just would not want to randomize people to no embolic protection. So um, more to come with regards to this study, obviously, but it's, it's actually ticking along quite nicely, even in the COVID era. So just a few concluding thoughts. Stroke remains an issue in TAVR. Clinical evidence demonstrates that use of Sentinel and TAVR reduces stroke. Again, really encourage you to look up that Jack Interventions article that just got published from the authors at Minneapolis Heart Institute. Uh, Sentinel is safe and adds no additional risk to patients. TAVR risk stroke is costly for hospitals and devastating to individuals and their caregivers. There are no definitive predictors of stroke in TAVR. And then finally, again, the underscored theme here is with the expansion of TAVR indications to lower risk and often less symptomatic younger patients, the need to protect the brain from stroke becomes even more important. So with that, uh, I'll end my uh, discussion here and i um, open to any thoughts or comments from, uh, obviously, people on the call. And uh, thanks again for Boston Sci to Boston Scientific for hosting us on this webinar. If anyone has any questions, you can raise your hand and ask them now, or you could enter them into the Q&A. Um, so here's the question from uh, Benaya Basial. The question is, what patients do you exclude from Sentinel? Uh, so, uh, you know, as an implanter, I would say that anyone who's anatomically ineligible, okay? So, I mean, we cap most, most of our patients radially. Um, and if we can't go radial, we'll go ulnar. And, of course, if we can't go ulnar, then red flags there. Uh, so, you know, I mean, those patients are probably not going to get, you know, a Sentinel put in. Uh, you know, if they don't fit the IFU and, you know, I could say as a physician that, you know, kind of really looking at those arteries pretty closely on my CT scan reconstructions, six and a half to 10 for the left common carotid, nine to 15 for the anominate, but there's wiggle room there. So if I've got an anominate that's like eight and change and there's not like calcium or plaque or tortuosity, then yeah, I'm going to put the Sentinel in. So, I mean, that in my practice gives me about a 70 to 80 percent utilization rate for the device. Uh, I would say that, you know, Cleveland Clinic, Samir Kapadia, he says he puts it in 95 plus percent of patients. Great. Uh, I just haven't had the ability to do that in, in my population. Great. Thank you for that. Um, just with the gamut of answers with the last polling question around barrier to Sentinel usage, can you describe, Dr. Gata, your initial learning curve with Sentinel? That's a great question. And keep in mind that we were not in the clinical trial. So when we brought Sentinel in, we were just novice users. And of course, I had seen it used at other places, but I had never personally used it. Um, I think that the learning curve for me was about 10 cases. And that included some bovines thrown in there as well. Um, and after 10, it was pretty much just no issue whatsoever. It was like, it was like just doing the transcatheter valve replacement procedure itself. Um, so I think the learning curve is actually very short and the deflectible nature of the compound catheter for an interventional cardiologist. I mean, this is something that makes total sense. Why don't we have deflectible compound catheters for everything, you know, engaging tough coronaries, engaging peripheral anatomy when we're doing mesenteric angiograms and stuff like that. I mean, it would be great to have that form of catheter manipulation. And so intuitively it makes a lot of sense and it makes it very easy to engage uh, the left common carotid from, um, from the ascending aorta and arch. Dr. Tom Wagner has raised his hands. Dr. Wagner, did you want to go move forward with your question? He is, let's see, he's unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hamill, great, great uh, discussion there. Great uh, slide presentation. And uh, we're in protected TAVR, and uh, we are one of the top enrollers right now. You are, you're, 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 the, you're the top enroller, Tom. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, I, I have had this uh, 
this question has been posed by uh, our team at some at some juncture about you know whether should we stop the trial and just continue doing uh, sentinel on everybody or do we need the data? And I think so far I just posed a question. Here's the question about this: What are your thoughts about the non adjudicated 0.6 percent stroke rate in Partner Three and the need for CPS? Though there there is the side of the bench that will argue uh, you know the stroke rates are so low in in the you know, the balloon expandable the Tabar uh, family uh, you know as low as 0.6 percent. From my review, a lot of those trials, they're not adjudicated by a neurologist. And what are your yeah, thoughts about yeah. that and the need for CPS in those studies? I'm going I'm to give Dave the non-adjudicated neurologist part of that, but I, I will just I think you knew my answer. Three. Yeah, I'll pick up partner three for just a moment because, as you know, 33% of people that were put into partner three were screen failed, predominantly based on anatomic issues. Is it LVOT calcium? They were borderline size. Those people were excluded out of the trial. Now, Medtronic low risk had a higher stroke rate, but that, that was like less than half of the people that were screen failed and they took in difficult anatomies. So I'm going to say that that data is very messy with regards to stroke. And in no way, shape or form would I believe that we're going to get down to a 0.6% stroke rate uh, in, 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 the, in the population. You look at TVT registry. I mean, the stroke rate's been clicking along at pretty much the same rate the entire time. And if you look at the nationwide inpatient sample data that Minneapolis Heart Institute just published, that's a 3.8% Stroke rate. Now, that's probably on the low side, right, Dave? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it's probably over 4%. However, you know, you could argue it both ways. You could say even 0.6% is too much, right? Six out of a thousand people could have pretty disabling. These are non-adjudicated, meaning that it was so obvious anyone can walk in the room and say, oh, this guy's having a stroke, right? That's what non-adjudicated means to me as a neurologist. It was adjudicated that 9.1% that we saw in one of the other studies, the, the Sentinel study. I mean, that is well adjudicated. These are folks who got MRIs. These are folks who, uh, you know, someone like myself, not necessarily vascular trained, but a general neurologist or a fellow or, or one of these folks walks in there and says, all right, I found some subtle, you know, dysmetria on exam or, or some other findings there, you know, um, visual field deficits, can't see half of their visual field. I mean, again, the whole idea of a minor stroke or an SBI uh, totally, uh, totally false. I don't believe the 0.6%. I just don't. I mean, some data is just, um, is just not correct. And, and, you know, we, we could say that at 0.6%, but I think you answered your own question. It was not adjudicated. Uh, a lot of these folks may just be, Oh, you know, I know you can't tie your shoes now, but I'm going to send you home anyway. You didn't have it. Oh, yeah. I, I, I agree with both of you, honestly. I mean, we use the ones we use filters on, I can tell you, Hamill, and Dave, we catch debris in probably 90 to 95% yeah. of these cases. Yeah. We're, we're catching e at least sand. We call it cerebral sand, which is like the fine little micro fragments of calcium, whether it's from the arch or from the valve, from the valvuloplasty, from from the crud or wherever it comes from. But we see cerebral sand at a minimum on every single case. And then we have those other probably two-thirds of the cases that have actually chunks of calcium, whether it's leaflet or it's calcium yeah, no arch calcium. I mean – it's a, it's impressive uh, to see what we catch in every single filter. And, and as you said, when we harvest it, there's always something in there. So I'm a big proponent of this and a believer in it for sure. Great. There was a question from Man Mender Bular. Did you want to move, go with your question? Oh, here it is right here. Are you going in with a JR4 catheter first to the aortic root and then switching for a long 014 and then loading the sentinel device over it or just going straight in with a sentinel device and an 014 to decrease some time for device deployment? I like to go straight in with the device. I, I think, again, with that deflectible compound catheter, it offers a lot of, I mean, it's even better than a coronary catheter. So, I mean, you could try to take a JR4 in, you'll have some tortuosity, you may have to do some newfangled movements or whatever, but I mean, with even with the flex wheel on the the number two knob on, on the Sentinel, I mean, getting even past tortuous and nominate anatomy is very easy. I use a Grand Slam wire usually. Um, you know, in some cases, if I need a little bit more finesse and manipulating the wire up to the common carotid, then I may switch out for a BMW. Uh, but those are my two wires that I use, and uh, I usually just go right in with the device. It saves time, and it's a very easy device to use and manipulate to deploy those two baskets. Well, I will say the one time that we do use a JR4 is if there's a bovine arch, yeah, uh, type I mean, two arch. But, but Tom, will. actually, what, I, what I'll say is like, you know, even in those cases, like, I mean, you could use that deflectible compound catheter. As soon as you jet out of the innominate, you just point it right towards where the common trunk and, and carotid would take off, and you can just use that deflectible nature of it. 
Yeah, you can do it both ways. That's the one time we will use it is we'll pre-wire if it's a, if it's a bovine yeah. Uh, yeah, arch. That's the only time I would, I would use a GR4. Mm -hmm. Great. There was another question that came in. Do you see better cognitive functioning post or with Sentinel versus without using Sentinel? Is it noticeable? Dave? Uh, well, I think it's an actually an anecdotal question for you, right? Because I'm just called on the folks that are ready. Yeah. They know is are, are going to have a, had a stroke um, or some sort of cog, you know uh, minor dysfunction or, or major. Uh, I think the, the question is for you. Um, looking at these folks, since you do the sentinels and have done non sentinels, have you noticed uh, better cognitive? Yeah, it's a great question, and, and I'm going to say anecdotally, yeah, absolutely. I used to get into fights with my anesthesiologist because I'd be like, "What are you doing to these patients? You know, they're 85 to 90 years old. You're you're like obtunding them, and and then four hours after the procedure, they're not responsive. Like, what the heck is going on? What are you giving these folks? That doesn't happen anymore." So now 85 to 90 year old patients I'm putting in the Sentinel, they're like completely lucid 10 to 15 minutes after the procedure as they should have been. And I think that we were just not adjudicating well back in the day when we were not putting in Sentinel. And I think that that's, that's absolutely, you know, that's absolutely true. Let me give and you so, an explanation yeah, for that, right? Yeah. So older folks in general have less cognitive reserve, that's what we call yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Right. So, so a couple little hits, maybe you and I, perhaps more mm -hmm. you than, than I can take that. Uh, right. But, uh, you know, uh, these older folks, 80s and 90s, I mean, even a tiny little hit can be devastating for them. They could be out altered mental status, right? Yeah, for, absolutely. for hours or days, you know, delirious. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I think that could explain your, your anecdotal report. Dave, is there, is, there a good way, is there a good way of measuring that? Like, I mean, are there, are there scales that, that you would use to measure lucidity after a procedure? There, there are. We don't really routinely use them. They're not really that well uh, verified. Oh. Um, but, uh, you know, we do a lot of times get, um, EEG, um, to make sure they're not having, having some subclinical status of lepticus. Um, and I think the MRI is a truth meter anyway, mm -hmm. I mean, you'll, you'll see hits or you won't. And I think mm -hmm. that, um, it's, you know, the degree of lucidity is l as less relevant than the fact that they all, they were fine, you know, pre-procedure and then they are not fine afterwards. So, um, you know, we'll do a stroke scale score in them and, and some other, uh, you know, scales, but for the most part, uh, the, the, the decision analysis really comes in what, what tests we're going to run next, MRI, EEG, maybe even a lumbar puncture if, if they've developed a fever or other things. But for the most part, we get our answer with the MRI. And if it's, if it's after a procedure or surgery, I mean, chances are, um, you know, you're going to have uh, emboli to the brain. And, and, and back to that initial question too, you and I were talking offline beforehand about five-year and 10-year data. Yep. Right. And I think that's a great other, the other answer to, to that great question about cognitive deficits. Um, and will we see that in the, in the trial? Uh, you know, we don't know right now. I mean, I think the, the, the primary endpoint of protective TAVR is all stroke, right? Hemorrhagic, ischemic, undetermined, disabling, non-disabling. But, you know, there's going to be some secondary endpoints that are really interesting to us as neurologists and to you guys too, right? Um, because you see this anecdotally, the folks that you know, do well or don't do well or altered or not altered post uh, TAVR uh, with or without Sentinel. So I think that data five and 10 years later, you're really going to see is going to be damning. I think for the folks that didn't get TAVR, they're going to be a lot worse. Great. Awesome. I think get the Sentinel, I should say. <laughs> well, with that, it looks like we don't have any more questions from our participants. So I have to say, let's wrap up the call. Dr. Rose and Dr. Gata, this was again, a fantastic presentation and discussion about stroke and TAVR and evolving economics. So we thank you all for attending this evening's program, everybody. So have a good night, be well. Have a great night. Thank you. All right.